me when I come back. So once again, I wish all participants a wonderful time and my hope is that this edition of Zix Lecture Series will give us definite answers to questions regarding our nationhood at this time. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hello. It's okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. That suffices for your opening remarks. You will have you back again for your talk, sir. Welcome. May I invite now the Dean Faculty of Social Sciences, the host Dean, Professor Frank Collins, Namdi Okafor, for his welcome address. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, the benefactor, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let me you grant me the grace to stand on the already established protocol. On behalf of the staff and students of the Faculty of Social Sciences, I wish to welcome you to the 12th Zik Lecture Series of our great faculty and the university at large. We thank the Almighty God who made this year's event possible in spite of the current economic predicaments and uncertainties which have become the signature tune of our definition as a nation. Today again we have gathered as the learned belts in quest for an answer to their night chilling crosses. A galaxy of the best of the best in search of the soul of a continent. A soul that is naturally blessed but pierced by the sharp sword of calculated conspiracies nurtured by deliberate systemic discontinuities. From Professor Okodeban Nolly, Assisi Asobie, President J.J. Rollins, President Benjamin Nkapa, President Enes Baikoroma, Prime Minister Rael Daudinga, Tatiku Abubaka, Tufemeka Anyoko, Professor Welose Inka, and other distinguished leaders of the nation and the continent respectfully. The Zik Lecture Series has recurrently demonstrated its determination to interrogate the system with a view to providing a resounding answer to recurrent decimals in the life of a continent in a seemingly life support. The 12th edition of this numero uno of a series is very unique as it showcases the intellectual blowing of a mother, a leader, administrator, civil rights crusader, philanthropist, and the first female president of Malawi, who is not only beautiful, but a beauty with a beautiful heart. Embroidered with a very beautiful topic, reclaiming Zeke's world, climate justice, and Africa's sustainable development. With her tall global pedigree, the first woman to mount the exalted Zeke Lecture Series platform, decorated by the exalted personality and generosity of the benefactor, distinguished Senator Ben D.O.B.C.O.N., and the uncommon support of our Vice Chancellor, Professor Charles. Okechukwe Simone, fellow Academy of Science, fellow Pharmaceutical Society of Nigeria, and inspired by the inexhaustible
multiply ideas that define the Zix world. Thank you, Madam President, for accepting to be here. And to the glory of God, here you are. We say no. I also appreciate our distinguished guest of honor, Mr. Peter Gregory Obi, former governor of Anambra State and presidential candidate of the Union, We are happy that you are here with us. The royal fathers of the day, we also appreciate you, His Royal Majesty, Igwe Alfred Achebe, who is unavoidably absent. Obi of Onisha and His Royal Majesty, Obi Dr. Gibson Wabez and Wosu Ezuzoka, and all the royal fathers here present, you are all well appreciated. Thank you for accepting us the way we are. We cannot forget the Azikiwe family, led by Professor Uchi Azikiwe, for keeping the flag flying in spite of all odds. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, May you join me to specially thank our amiable and ever resourceful Vice Chancellor, Professor Charles Okechuku Esimone, fellow Academy of Science. Who has shown the Zik Lecture Series and the faculty in general great love and support. He has consistently played unprecedented chief host to the lecture series and contributed both financially and otherwise, to the success of the series. We are sure that before the end of this month, Ulukan Ajuku will hand over to us, to the faculty, the beautiful edifice he built to serve as the new faculty of social sciences building. <laughs> Ulukan Ajuku, God bless you. To the university community, we say thank you and in particular, staff and students of the Faculty of Social Sciences who have strongly transmitted the current faculty mantra of doing ordinary things extraordinarily into reality through their unalloyed support. The untiring efforts of the 12th Zik Lecture Series Committee, led by the advisor, Professor A.U. Nonyelo, and the chairman, Professor Uche Ebeze, cannot go unappreciated. Thank you so much. To all our guests, we say a very big thank you to you too for coming in spite of the current realities on ground. Once more, I'll welcome you all to this great intellectual harvest as we wish you journey messages to your various destinations with the hope of reclaiming Zeke's world through climate justice and development. May we continue in doing ordinary things extraordinarily. Zikomo Kwambiri. Thank you very much. A round of applause for that. It couldn't have been better taken than this. That was the Dean, Faculty of Social Sciences, Professor Frank Collins. May I respectfully at this point invite our amiable Vice Chancellor, Chancellor, the Vice Chancellor who has been working despite COVID, despite strike, despite everything, to make this university almost, not almost, better than Nigeria. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, let me say, oh, let me please welcome the Vice Chancellor of Peter University. Professor Amazing One Emmanuel. Mr. Vice Chancellor, this is, sir, uh, I wish this country would do for Nigerians what you are doing in this university. I just wish that. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir. Thank you very much. 
and I love you too. <laughs> and I'm sure you know that. Thank you. Thank you. His Excellencies, the Executive Governor for your state, who is the Chairman of this Electoral Series, His Excellency, the Executive Governor of Anambra State, who is our overall host, Buruburu, His Excellency, Her Excellency, the former President of Malawi, who is the keynote uh, speaker for today and has been aptly described as the first uh, female le guest lecturer for this lecture series. We recognize you respectfully. Mm -hmm. His Excellency, the former governor of Anambra State, Okutendibu, Aine Kenegi. His Excellency, the former Senate President of this country, and by the grace of God, the BOT Chairman of PDP, Aine Kenegan as again now. All our guests who, are, who have been uh, well recognized, I must not also fail to recognize, you know, uh, Eyom, uh, Josephine Aneni, one time Minister of the Federal Republic. Uh, I'm happy that you are here with us, ma. Another guest, uh, distinguished senators that accompanied His Excellency, and all our friends from far and wide. I want to welcome you and I want us in presenting this address to publicly again as we usually do uh, recognize and appreciate uh, the man behind the Zeke Lecture Series, uh, High Chief Senator Dr. Ben Diobi and the amiable wife and I want us to do so with a hand of applause for unto him. He has committed his time, he has committed resources, he has committed on common treasure to see to the continuation of this series. We can't thank him enough. We appreciate him sincerely. Our principal officers who are here, the DVCs, the registrars and bosses, I recognize all of you. I must also use the opportunity to recognize uh, my dear wife, who is also here. You are under our divide. I thank you again. I thank all our, our staff and importantly the great students of Funam Dazikwe University. Great UNISIC students. Greatest UNISIC students. Greatest Baba. Greatest Bobo. Greatest Uh huh. I'm immensely delighted to welcome you all to the 12th edition of the Zeke Lecture Series. The consistency is spanning four successive administrations of the university and finesse with which these lectures have so far been organized is quite impressive. I salute the steadfastness of the benefactor in perpetuity of the Zeke Lecture Series, High Chief Senator Ben Ndiobi, C.O.N. Ujeli Bondibo Nine. I want to thank the Chairman Board of Trustees and Governing Council, who oh, is the Chairman Board of Trustees and Governing Council of American University of Nigeria, EULA. Over these years, this lecture series, through his intermediation, has attracted eminent national and international personalities as chairpersons, as guest speakers, and guests through the magnetic cloud and extensive reach of Chief Ben Diobi. We cannot uh, overemphasize that. That is the fact. A catalog of the galaxy of such guest speakers will attest the magnitude of his influence across the length and breadth of Africa. He has brought the following eminent persons. Flight Lieutenant J.J. Rollins, a former President of the Republic of Ghana, Right Honorable Raila Odinga of Kenya, who was at the forefront in the fight for multi-party democracy in that country and was later elected Prime Minister of the country. His Excellency Alaji Atiku Abubakar, GCON, then Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. He has also brought the Nobel Laureate, Professor Wole Shoinka, His Excellency Adams Oshimole, 
at the time of the media past governor of one time a media past governor of Edo State. He has also brought His Excellency Benjamin Nkapa, a former president of Tanzania. He has brought His Excellency Ernest Bai Koromo, former president of Sierra Leone, and His Excellency Dr. Kayode Fayemi, then the governor of Ekipi State. Prof. Mike Ozekome SAN, renowned Nigerian legal practitioner, and today, Her Excellency Dr. Joyce Hilda Banda, former president of Malawi, the first female to feature in this lecture series as guest speaker. What a galaxy of state persons. As if these efforts were not enough, I tried by an unabating gusto to keep alive the legacies of Chief Dr. Namda Zikiwe, GCFR, the doing of the Nigerian independence struggle and the arrowhead of African nationalism, instituted with the university administration, the Institute of Legislative Studies, to put in place a platform for building the capacity for good governance in the country. And that institute um, is being palpably represented, as we speak now, with a gigantic uh, building that will soon be commissioned even before the middle of next year. We need to appreciate Ben Diodi again. Through his efforts, the construction of the legislative building complex which he attracted to house the Institute has reached an advanced stage. Today, as in all previous edition of this lecture series, he is further dignifying this event with his amiable presence. We welcome him today, as always, and cannot say how grateful we are and shall remain. I can now enjoy the honor of welcoming our notable guests. It is with great respect that I welcome Your Excellency, Professor Charles Chukuma Soludo CFR, the Executive Governor of Anambra State, who is the Chief Host. I also welcome in a special way Mr. Gregory Pitobi, former Executive Governor of Anambra State and Labour Party Presidential Candidate in Nigeria's February election. He's a distinguished guest of honor. I also welcome in a special way the Chairman of the event, Dr. His Excellency, Dr. Shea Makinde, Executive Governor of Oyo State. We have welcomed, but we cannot fail to keep on welcoming Her Excellency Joyce Hilda Banda, the former President of Malawi. With the reverence that is due to motherhood, I also appreciate Professor Uchi Azikiwe, wife of the late Dr. Namda Azikiwe, and we introduce her as a spouse. That must be remembered, and that she's going to make a mark, and she has made a mark for herself as a professor. The theme of this lecture, Reclaiming Zeke's Wall, Climate Justice and Africa's Sustainable Development, is particularly significant. To my mind, it brings in the name of Zeke, his worldview, into an extant global phenomenon, climate change, that is causing grave concerns in the world or should I say, the industrialized world. The theme arouses curiosity as to who Zeke was, his worldview. It connotes that that world has been lost or vitiated somewhere along the line and now needs to be reclaimed. It captures the dilemma of Africa and its socioeconomic development aspirations that while the industrialized world is seeking global action to curtail carbon emission, the culprit for climate change, resulting principally from industries in the industrialized world, Africa, which is still struggling to industrialize and thus contribute minimally to carbon emission, will bear the brunt of global actions on carbon emission. It's a paradox, a dilemma, and we're going to see how this will be addressed. The guest lecturer, Her Excellency, Dr. Joyce Hilda Banda, is not only a former head of state, but has continued to remain relevant in matters of international concern. And so anxiously, we await her delivery. I want to use the occasion again to announce to us that as part of management's contribution to the wonderful legacy that the distinguished Senator Ben Diobi has left, a management has proposed, and we're going to consolidate that as fast as possible, that the Zix lecture series 
that is held every day on the 16th of November, being Zeke's birthday, will henceforth metamorphose into Founders Day for Namda Zikiwa University. We pray that the University Senate and the Council, when they receive this proposal, will give it the due uh, approval that is needed. So that by next year, by the grace of God, we'll not only be celebrating this six lecture series, but we'll be celebrating it as the Founders Day of our great University of Africa, of Namda Zikiwa University. Once again, I welcome you all. And I want to thank you for being here. We look forward to a very fruitful lecture. And as our guests will be going back here after, we pray God to grant them Johnny Messis. Thank you very much. Yes, the Vice Chancellor already knows we love him. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice Chancellor. My quickly and respectfully, very great sense of responsibility, invite one of the distinguished Nigerians who is the benefactor of this annual Zik lecture, a gentleman who, other than being a benevolent young man, is a, pol a politician of distinction in this country. Chief Dr. Ben Ndiobi Ojalibo Ndiobi. Excellencies, President Joyce Bander, Governors Shei Makine, Chukuma Soludo, Greg Peter Obi, may I therefore respectfully stand on the already established protocols due to time. I will be brief because my speech is in the brochure you are having, but just to say a few things. One, I want to thank immensely the management and staff of DAR Communications, AIT, for their annual ritual of carrying this event live every year. <laughs> to that extent, I want to please request of all of us to rise for a minute silence in honor of two great men, High Chief Dr. Raymond Alewu Dokwesi and our late father who passed on early this month, Pa Soludo. So may we please all be upstanding for a minute silence in their memory. May their great and gentle souls rest in peace. I want to thank the Vice Chancellor and the entire management of the Namdi Azikiwe University for holding forth in the course of this lecture series annually. This is the 12th year. Having said that, 
It is with great joy and honor that I welcome everyone to the 12 Zik Lecture Series in commemoration of President Dr. Namdi Azikiwe, GCFR, Zik of Africa. Zik of Africa was the first country's only black governor general between 1960 and 1963, president of the Senate 1960, and president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1963 to 1966. As Zik mentioned in the motto of the West African pilot, it says, and I quote, show the light and the people will follow, end of quote. The light was shown to me and I found my way to Lilongwe, Malawi. On that note, please permit me to welcome in a very special way our keynote speaker, Her Excellency Dr. Joyce Hilda Banda, former president of Malawi. Madam President, you are welcome to my hometown and to the state of the great Zika of Africa. To my governor, His Excellency Professor Charles Soludo, I thank you for your contributions towards the success of this lecture series, especially by agreeing to host our keynote speaker, President Joyce Bander, and her entourage. I want to thank you for honoring us with your presence. I just want to draw your attention, Mr. Governor. If by any chance you left a banana peel at the Central Bank, I appeal to you to try very hard to remove the peel. Because since you left, Sanusi was suspended. After Sanusi left and was suspended, Emefiele was suspended. Not only was he suspended, he was detained by the DSS, and then DSS handed him over to EFCC. So there must have been something that you left there <laughs> that has not given them a way of getting out of these challenges. To my dear Aburo, I cannot thank you enough, Your Excellency, the executive governor, performing and Toknaru governor of Oyo State, Engineer Sheyi Makinde, fellow of the Society of Engineers. As I speak, I know that the Sultan of Sokoto has been in Oyo State waiting for him. The program for 11 o'clock this morning, he graciously shifted it to 4 p.m. so as to participate in this lecture series. <laughs> There is a song we used to sing those days when we were younger. Jojo lo, Jojo lo, Omo de Jojo lo, Un lore ele du mare, Eje ko mo de o wa, Eje ko mo de o wa o, Eje ko mo de o wa, Jojo lo, Jojo lo, o un lore ele du mare, eje komo de uwa. And finally, to my very, very young and able brother, Okute Peter Obi. For the past 12 years, you have religiously been part and parcel of this event. I thank you, and I'll continue to thank you and appreciate you for all of that. 
the project for the permanent site of the institute by God's grace will be handed over to the vice chancellor and his team in April. So I want to thank every one of us for coming and we await to hear from the wisdom of knowledge of High Excellency President Joyce Hilda Banda. Thank you. A round of applause for Okutendebu. Uh, so, uh, but the benefactor. Ladies and gentlemen, may we very specially welcome the executive governor of the great state we are in. Anambra State, His Excellency, Mr. Governor, Professor Charles Chukuma. Thank you very much. Amazing, amazing. Amazing, amazing department. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I am being directed, and I think it's perfectly in order, that His Excellency the Governor, incumbent Governor of Anambra State, properly should be the last person to speak as the host governor may we now disregard the protocol the program as presented to us by the faculty of social sciences and not the university <laughs> mr vice chancellor the error is that of political science thank you very much let me, for the second time, welcome a governor who every inch looks like an evil man. Handsome, intelligent, loaded. Who has been here once to make a remark. And coincidentally, the only evil thing he remembers is ego. I don't mind that. He will also remember intellectualism because that goes with the evil man too. But looking at him from head to toe, he looks every inch an evil man. Mackinde. I've been to Oyo State several times, to Ibadan several times. Go to Ibadan and see what is happening. Not that it's close to what is currently happening in Anambra State. I'm not saying that. Let me invite for an address now of our friend and brother, His Excellency, Shay Mackinde. <laughs> After which we take the lectures, Your Excellency. Well, uh, thank you for having me uh, uh, back. I left so some things that I didn't say the last time, so now is the time to say those uh, those things. Well, permit me to uh, stand on the already established protocol as I deliver this uh, opening address. Well, today, the 16th November, is the birthday of Dr. Namde Azakiwe. Were he still alive, it will be 119 years today. 
having been born 10 years before the am amalgamation of Northern and Southern Nigeria in 1914. Zik of Africa, as he is more popularly called, he was born in Zungeru, which is in present-day northern Nigeria. He was educated in Lagos. Lagos is in western Nigeria. And his parents were, of course, from this place, eastern Nigeria. So we can understand why he had a national outlook and why he believed in oneness and indivisibility of Nigeria. Because if there's not that national outlook, it will offend some people. If he says uh, uh, he's leaning towards uh, the north, it will offend his parent people. If he says, no, it's Lily towards the east, it will offend people from his uh, place of birth. If he says, no, okay, it's Lily towards the northern people, it will offend the people that educated him. Well, what have we seen? 2023, we have just uh, risen from another election where ethnicity was used as a tool for campaign and religion was placed in the front burner. Maybe some of you, you've forgotten. Uh, uh, I was part of uh, a group called G5 then during the electioneering. And what did we say? We said, well, after eight years of uh, presidency in the northern part of Nigeria, let it also come to the southern part of Nigeria. And we held a meeting, the governors, the Southern Governors Forum, in uh, first at Asaba and then in Lagos. And we said, irrespective of political party, let the presidency come to the southern part of Nigeria. And some people said, Emiloka, because uh, I'm from southern part of uh, the country. Also, inside my own political party, somebody said, look, I, uh, uh, it doesn't matter whether the president has been in the north or something like that. It's also my turn because uh, I come from the favored uh, a group. Well, this event, Zig Annual Lecture, gives us another opportunity. It's another opportunity for us to talk about nationhood. Let me share with you this quote I found that provides us food for thought at this time of our nationhood. These words were spoken by the father of Nigerian nationalism. And by the way, Zeke spoke Yoruba and he also spoke some Aousa and of course his mother tongue, Igbo. He said, each of our three regions is vastly different in many respects, but each has this in common, that despite variety of languages and custom or difference in climate, we all form a part of one country which has existed as a political and social entity for 50 years. That is why we believe that the political union of Nigeria is destined to be perpetual and indestructible. This was said by Zeke in 1959. I mean, that's uh, 15 months 
to Nigeria's independence. And eight years before me standing before you, before I was even born. Don't mind the, the other guy saying, I'm a young man. I'm getting there. I'm getting mature right now. So today, over 60 years after Nigeria's independence, Nigeria has managed to continue remaining perpetual and indestructible. We have survived a civil war and several campaigns by state and non-state actors to sow seeds of division that will separate us. Yet, we remain as one. Perhaps there is a lesson in there for us. Well, I believe in the unity of Nigeria. And I believe we should, as a nation, have moved beyond asking the question regarding whether we want to stay together. From our history, from even uh, the circumstances surrounding Zeke's birth, his education, and the role he played when Nigeria was uh, at a crossroad. So we shouldn't be talking about, should we be together? We're already together. So the question we should be asking is, how? How is this structure? How is it, how is the structure benefiting everybody? What structure is best for us all? Remember in the First Republic, Zik worked with a parliamentary type of government. And by the time the Second Republic came, he was also willing, he stood election, uh, and willing to work with a federal system of government. So what this tells me is that he's a dynamic man who did not remain adamantly holding on to one system or way of doing things. He was determined to think in accordance with the times. So as we have a conversation around reclaiming Zeke's world and linking this to climate change and sustainability, a good question to ask is, if Dr. Namde Azekiwe were alive today and still able to influence Nigeria as it did in the past, what will he be telling us right now? One thing we know for sure is that he will not be talking about breaking Nigeria apart or saying that because uh, someone from his part of the country did not win elections, then the country should split. I don't think that is what uh, my leader, uh, Governor Peter Obi, as, as, uh, has been saying to us. In fact, when I listened to him uh, at the press conference, I was really, really very happy because he did not pollute the well through which he may even drink water in the future. And as I sat there, I was talking to my brother, uh, Professor Charles uh, uh, Soludo, because I came from Cairo. He was there earlier before me. I came from Cairo yesterday. And from Cairo to Abuja, we spent five and a half hours there about. Still the same continent is not, whether from, the, uh, from north to the southernmost part, uh, part or from the east to the westernmost part. This is just from one corner, you know, Cairo to Abuja, and we spent five hours. And I told him that uh, some people sat in Berlin, 1886, and they tore everywhere apart and just uh, uh, picked their own uh, part of it. So, what is before us is not just only uniting Nigeria, but also uniting Africa. 
So I don't think Zeke will ask us at this time that we should split. No, I believe it will be forward thinking. Focus on how to foster coherence through a structure that is fair to all. In 1949, if you go into the history book, Zeke called it self-determination within the framework of a federated commonwealth of Nigeria and the Cameroon. I call it a restructuring along the lines of true federalism. There will be left, less focus on who becomes president, especially with reference to the person's ethnicity. If we listen to uh, what Zeke has even told us way back in 1949. One of the main reasons that we are concerned about equity and justice in the center is because governance is over centralized. So it is my hope that the government at the center today moves with the times and listening to the true yearnings of the people. Yes, we are facing economic hardship. The uh, VC was uh, greeting everybody and thanking them for coming despite this economic hardship because well, price has gone uh, uh, through uh, uh, the roof, but we will not be the first country in the world to face economic hardship. So as I entered in my opening remarks, there are two ways to react to the difficulties we are facing. We can sit around and point fingers as to what will have happened if X or Y had become president. Instead, or we can think through how to come out of this hardship. We can innovate out of this hardship through healthy competition and collaboration between and among the federating units. So for me, my passing short. And when I finish saying it, just take the message, don't shoot the messenger, I will be out through the door on my way to. So my passing shot is a complete restructure of Nigeria is needed. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Governor Sir. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we will still have to do a slight restructuring of the program before we get very tired. We have to take the lectures. Let me invite to take the citation of the guest lecturer, Dr. Tochuku Ogwebwe. Tochuku, please step forward to take the citation so that we can take the lecture proper, after which we take the other marks. Tochuku, please. Where is Tochuku? Dr. Tochuku? Ogwebwe. My respectfully, Dr. Tochuku Ogwebwe for the citation. The Executive Governor of Anambra State, the former Governor of Anambra State, I think in the absence of our Vice Chancellor, may I hide under your protection and your authority to call on the 12th Zix Lecturer Guest Speaker, Her Excellency, Madam President, to please come forward 
and Ida find a suitable place to sit beside us or stand. However, she will want to handle it. Please. If you want to stand, if you want to sit, can someone help me to pick her seat? And then let's... Would you want to stand, man? Okay. May we invite her to please come and be upstanding. Okay. Okay. Okay, this is a brief citation of Dr. Joyce Hilda Banda, the former president of Malawi. It is Stephen Covey that once said that leaders are not born, they are self made. Her Excellency, Madam President, Joyce Hilda Banda started her life sojourn on the 12th of April 1950. In Malenia, a village in Zomba district of Nyansaland, now Malawi. Her father was an accomplished and popular police brass band musician. As education, whether formal or informal, presents as passport to the future, especially when tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. Her Excellency fortified herself for today with a Cambridge School certificate. A Bachelor of Arts degree in Early Childhood Education from Columbus University. A Bachelor of study, uh, Social Studies in Gender Studies from Atlantic International University, USA. And a Diploma in Management of NGOs from the International Labor Organization Center in Turin, Italy. She has a Master's degree in Leadership from Royal Rose University, Canada with Honorary Doctorate degree in 2012 from Jeonju University, South Korea. Guided heavily, guided heavily by the famous words of Dante Alighieri, that the darkest places in hell are reserved for those who maintain their neutrality in times of moral crisis. And the famous inclusion of Plato, that one of the penalties for refusing to participate in politics is that you end up being governed by your inferiors. Ladies and gentlemen, her Excellency began her political career in 1999 when she won a parliamentary seat in Malawi's democratic election under the, ruling, the then ruling United Democratic Front. Why in Parliament, the then President Baliku Muluzi appointed her as a Minister for Gender and Community Services, where she fought to enact the domestic violence bill and the National Platform for Action on Orphans, Vulnerable Children, and Zero Tolerance Campaign Against Child Abuse. Again in 2004, Her Excellency was re-elected into the Parliament, though in a different political party with the then ruling president and in confirmation of the submission of Aretha Franklin, that true virtue has no hiding place. It is not something you just put away. The then new president of Maui, President Dingo Wa Mutareka, in 2006, appointed Dr. Banda as Minister of Foreign Affairs. By 2009, President Mutareka found her worthy of a joint ticket during the country's presidential election. The victory saw Her Excellency as the first female Vice President of Malawi and second in the continent of Africa after Ellen Johnson of Liberia. Her tenure as Vice President of Malawi at some point was faced with deep-rooted crises of political intrigues and conspiracies. However, by 7th of April 2012, 
Her Excellency was sworn in as the fourth president of Malawi, marking her the first female president of Malawi, following the sudden death of her principal and boss, President Mutariga, due to heart attack. As president, Her Excellency faced a difficult task as Malawi ranked as one of the poorest countries with deepening political crisis, which was underscored by severe economic setbacks. With her resolute insistence and firm resolve to change the narrative, Her Excellency, Madam President, led from, from the forefront by cutting her salary by 30%, just to show that they too were making sacrifices at the top. And immediately also announced that the president's jet will be sold. <laughs> Under her watch, Malawi's operational industrial capacity improved from 35% in 2012 to 85% in July 2014. <laughs> A woman of many accolades prominent of which are the African Prize for Leadership for Sustainable End of Hunger in 1997 and being named the Africa Third Most Powerful Woman by Forbes magazine in 2011. <laughs> she has so many global awards ranging from leadership, democracy, girls' right to mention but a few. Men and brethren, her Excellency's post-presidential life has witnessed very numerous expository and impactful engagements nationally and internationally. She is involved with many grassroots projects with women, founded the Joyce Banda Foundation for Better Education, founded the Young Women Leaders Network, and the National Association of Business Women and Hunger Project in Malawi. She has served as Commissioner for Bridging a World Divided. Alongside personalities like Bishop Desmond Tutu and United Nations Human Rights Commissioner Mary Robinson. She is a member of the Advisory Board for Education in Washington, D.C. and on the Advisory Board for the Federation of World Peace and Love in Taiwan. Her Excellency's advocacy for the rights of women is deep rooted in basic principles of human psychology and economic power. Little wonder she is a firm believer that it is only when a woman is economically empowered that she can negotiate at, ho at household level and that she can negotiate at household level with her husband. I don't know why this phone keeps going off each time I want to mention husband. <laughs> I will repeat it again. <laughs> I said that if, uh, 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 Her Excellency's advocacy for the rights of women is deep rooted in the basic principles of human psychology and economic power. Little wonder she is a favor <laughs> Little wonder that it is only when a woman is economically empowered that she can negotiate at household level with her husband. <laughs> Even about the number of children that the brother of hers can have. A family woman so cherished by her husband that her excellency always profess that her dear husband Richard has been behind her success and rise to whatever level that she has become. And that her story and legacy is incomplete without his mention. She is blessed with five children. His Excellency, the Executive Governor of Anambra State, and my brother, the Vice Chancellor of the greatest university of the moment, the great benefactor of this lecture series, Ojeni Bondibo, the Ziggs family, members of the high table, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, join me to welcome with trembling. Her Excellency, Madam President, the 12th Ziggs guest lecturer to give us a presentation 
in coats of many colors. Thank you. afternoon fellow Africans. Your Excellency Chair of the Zeke Series today and Executive Governor of Oyo State. Your Excellency Professor Saludu, Executive Governor of Anambra State. You are one person I have highly admired throughout my life. It's a privilege to meet you at last. Your Excellency Peter Obi, former Executive Governor of Anambra State. I don't even need to say, I've just got an information that just my photo with him is trending in Malawi like crazy. Professor Charles Esinod, Vice Chancellor of Unanda's Kiwe University, Your Honor High Chief Senator, Dr. Ben D. Obi, my brother and your beautiful wife. May I also recognize in a special way all distinguished political leaders and the, my special Honor, Professor Yuche Azikiwe, wife of our great Nandi Azikiwe. All distinguished ladies and gentlemen, students, and my favorite group of young people. Today, I'm here to deliver this lecture. But I have a confession to make. I say things as they are. So if anybody gets offended, I am sorry, but that's how I'm born. <laughs> People have articulated the great Azikiwe's story, where he was born, and so on, his story. I will skip that and talk about this great man, as Africa knows him, and what I think he stands for. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm in the habit of getting to a place for the first time and finding what I can learn from that country. During the elections of this country, I was privileged to be requested by America to lead the observer team of NDI and IRI. I don't know why, but they just felt this African woman will lead this observer to you. While I was here, Arise Broadcasting Channel asked to interview me. And one thing I learned for the first time in Nigeria, the question that came from the anchor was, uh, what about vote buying in Malawi? And I said, what is that? Because distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I had never heard about vote buying in my life. Where I come from, the last elections of 2020, the sitting president used the TPEX to change figures. Our award-winning judiciary nullified the elections. Distinguished letter. So when I went home, being interviewed how Nigeria was, I told them about this question, and Malawians were abused. We learn every day. Vote by. 
today now to my speech I have decided that I will broaden my theme we will touch a lot of issues at the end of which I will ask questions that you will take home because Africa needs answers to the issues that are affecting us nobody is going to come into Africa to do this for us we must do it ourselves and the Zik of Africa the great Zik of Africa led the way today 16th of November is not a an ordinary day. Nandi Azikiwe would have been 119 as you've heard already. He died at the age of 91 in May 1996. We are here to honor the life of a gallant fighter for human rights and justice. A man that embodied humanity and servant leadership. A man who we are and have continued to celebrate the great Azikiwe of Africa. We are also a few weeks away from October 1, the day that he became first president of the Repub Federal Republic of Nigeria in 1963. A formidable journalist turned political activist and president whose leadership acumen made the colonial powers try in vain to block his ascendancy to the president. To the presidency, I have therefore always wondered why, when we talk about our revolutionary leaders, our founding fathers, we will mention Nyerere, Kaunda, and we we'll mention Mandela, and often leave out Azikiwe. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is your duty as Nigerians to amplify this name. This is no small name. Azikiwe was a great man just as great as Nyerere, as Kaunda, as everybody else. Nobody is going to do it for you but yourselves. I'll give you an example of what I did myself. Kamuzu Banda was, attended the first founding meeting of the Organization of African Unity. And in 2013, we were celebrating 50 years. And I got to the African Union headquarters and they had put all the names on the wall of people they honor and recognize as our founding fathers and Kamuzu Banda's name was not there his picture was not up and I told the organizers I told African Union I'll go back to my hotel until that picture is up we must do the same for Azikiwe we must never allow his name to be omitted because he's a great son of this continent. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, these lecture series are a befitting celebration of an African giant who through the power of his pen and paper here in Nigeria, Ghana and across Africa before independence gave us a platform to identify ourselves as proud Africans and consciously ignited the flames of colonial liberation across the many colonized countries of the African continent. And please follow me. I'm going to talk about women of Nigeria. And I want us to keep in mind that women of Nigeria, of Malawi, of South Africa stood up with their brothers to fight for self-rule. We we're not just sitting home. I'm therefore honored to be here as we celebrate Nanda Zikiwe legacy. I'm also humbled that it pleased the convening committee to consider me to be the first woman leader on this lecture series. I hope many more women leaders in various sectors of our African societies will have this honor and privilege to share their thoughts and join the rest of the continent in celebrating the great Zeke of Africa. I am grateful to Senator Ben Diwabi for traveling all the way to Malawi to come and request me to come here as guest. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. I had come a few years before 
on the invitation of a certain foundation. And I was treated very badly. Somehow, in other countries, when we, when we go, they want to treat us differently from our male counterparts. But what I, I didn't realize that I was mistreated until a fellow Nigerian woman came and told me, do you notice anything different? I said, no. In one hour, it was rectified. But then I made up my mind, I was never coming back to Nigeria as speaker. So when the uh, chief senator wrote to say he was coming to Malawi and told me what it was about, my husband said, oh, I thought you are never going to go to Nigeria again to speak. I said, yeah. Well, but he, my, my brother chief came to Malawi anyway. And when he said, well, we want you to give a lecture on Azikiwe, Nandi Azikiwe, the first to jump from his seat was my husband, not even me. Because this is a great man that we honor, even in that part of Africa. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this presentation now in interrogate and the, the intersection of current state of development in Africa, governance, climate justice, and other development-related issues that I think require our attention and action. So I have themed my discussion reclaiming Zik's world, climate justice and Africa's sustainable development. I, I deliberately added the sustainable development because we are going to go on a journey this, month, this afternoon. Bear with me, please don't doze. We have issues to rectify. As Africans, nobody is going to do it for us. Allow me, therefore, to start by going into the history of Africa. We were colonized by something like 80 plus years as African countries. And for all those years, we produced raw materials for Europe and what I call the global north. And in the meantime, they emitted emissions and destroyed our climate. And as it turns out now, it is the global south that is paying the price. That is what we must bear in mind this afternoon. Colonization still has a bad taste in our mouths. Decades long after our hero, like Ziki, to stood up and demanded what belonged and still belong to us, which is freedom and our wealth. It has been argued in other quarters that time is past for us to keep blaming some of Africa's challenges and the state of affairs on colonization and end, end, that ended decades ago. There's a case to be made either way, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Most African states are really independent from their colonizers. As to what extent that independence means, remains debatable. We have seen some former colonial powers continue to control how we should lead our lives and in the process cause economic and political instability. You have heard of the pact for the continuation of colonization applied in some West African countries by the French government, through which they are bonded to colonial power, including control of their hard earned reserves. In 1947, the pact, this, this 1947 pact has just been renewed two years ago to further enhance the colonial master's hold and control of those countries. Can we therefore say the whole Africa is free? Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this pact was designed to help France maintain control over its colonies. I therefore hold the view that unless we rise and fight together, as the governor said, stand united, we are not completely free. 
These are facts that one cannot wish away. Isn't it a fact as well that when the colonizers left, starting with Ghana 1957, they left broken education systems, broken health systems, agricultural systems that were in tatters, that we had to start from scratch with zero resources. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, therefore, colonization, industrial revolution, looting of African resources are interlinked, but have also led to climate change. I don't have to remind this audience that through colonization, Africa powered the industrial revolution and continues to power their economies, even now. We as a continent are paying for sins we did not commit at all, but emanating from our being colonized. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Africa's sustainable development or lack of it, therefore, is directly linked to climate change. Africa continues to be at the receiving end of climate change effects, with countries in the global south greatly affected by severe drought, floods, destructive storms that are tearing down infrastructure and sweeping away crops, leading to economic and political instability in some countries. These are countries that are already struggling to recover from global economic shocks. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, climate justice is therefore critical to holistically address challenges that most African states are encountering in their efforts to attain sustainable development. The global north, as the highest emitters of greenhouse gases, has a moral and financial obligation to help developing countries, and particularly Africa, mitigate global warming effects. By the way, because of the noise I've been making on this matter, in April of this year, I was appointed the Pan-African Justice, a Climate Justice Champion to amplify our African voice on the loss and damage agenda. <laughs> from here, I've been invited by the President of Angola to go and discuss peace in Africa. From there, I've been invited by President Ramaphosa to go and interact with our male counterparts. But from there, I'm going straight to Abu Dhabi. I want to sit there when we discuss climate justice. So climate change is no longer a theory or a future activity. Climate change is no future tense. It has no future tense. Climate change must be discussed in the present tense. It is a current norm, and we must aggressively mitigate or adopt to the changes to sustain our generation. We have a responsibility to preserve our future and our children's future. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this then brings me to the issue of wealth, natural resources. We are told that as a continent we hold 30% of the world's minerals. And I have argued that we may have more, even more than this. But yet, we have some of the poorest nations in the world. We, in state houses, those of us who call ourselves presidents and governors and ourselves every day, that the natural resources of our land is God's gift to his people and they don't belong to our pockets. My appeal to my fellow leaders is that first, we must inform ourselves that that wealth is not ours. If our country has diamonds, it belongs to the people. It's not ours. And as leaders, we are just custodians of that wealth on behalf of the people that we lead. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, 
This is a famous quote everywhere in the world that Joyce Banda, Joyce Banda of Malawi once said, leadership is a love affair. You must fall in love with the people you serve and the people must fall in love with you. If that is inculcated in your mind, if it, is, it sinks, you will not touch a single diamond that belongs to the people. We also have timber, we have fertilizer, we have fertile agricultural land, and the lot, lots of thermal and solar power. We as a continent are therefore not poor. I have dreamt of a day when such resources shall be used to uplift people's lives. Providing them with clean water, easy access to health facilities, and education for their children. I still have that dream that we shall bring meaning to our political independence. I also look forward to the day when African leaders shall learn to protect this wealth on behalf of their people, just like Botswana. I think I've seen a letter from Botswana here. In Botswana, when you get into that country, you don't even see a single diet anywhere. It is highly protected. But you can hear every day that is, Botswana is one of the richest countries on the continent. They, they have the highest reserves. And I pay tribute to Botswana's founding father, Serese Kama, who when they discovered the diamonds, he made sure there are measures put in place that it shall not be easily accessible. And this sitting president now, I'm told he has said, no export of our raw diamonds, but also Investors that want to come and invest in, min in mining in our country, 50-50. You are not going to exploit Africa all the way from wherever. You are going to come and it is going to be 50-50 with the people of Botswana. So when somebody in Botswana gets land, he will go to the government to get a tractor. And then he will go and, ma and, and farm. And he will go back to government to get seeds and fertilizers free. And he will send his child from standard one all the way to university free. That is what I'm talking about. When a country is rich, the wealth belongs to the people and the leaders must ensure that people are enjoying that wealth. I have always imagined that if he, Azikiwe, Dr. Nandi Azikiwe had been alive, this is the kind of leader we were going to have. And unfortunately, his tenure was cut short. And me as a politician, I do understand, oh my God, you don't know what we do to each other in politics. But I wish he had been given enough time because he had laid the foundation for the prosperity and unity of this country called Nigeria. It is pleasing to note that African countries like Zimbabwe and Ghana now have taken the resolute measures to impose strong regulatory measures on exploitation and exportation of their precious minerals. As a continent, we must be vigilant and stop these old and late night flights that land in forests, airstrips, air and fly out with our precious stones to unknown destinations. I don't know if you know this, but there are some countries on the continent, when you fly, you see strips, air strips, and they will come and land at night and load. Nobody knows whether with the, with the knowledge of the leaders, but they are able to land, load, and leave the country. Here in West Africa, one country has demonstrated that if you change that narrative, if you take control of your minerals, you can become one of the fastest growing economies in the world. So, this should be inspiration for us. This should encourage us. We are a rich continent. We are a huge continent with abundant arable land. That's why sometimes I laugh when I see the map of Africa against the world. They, they put it, they squeeze it so that it looks small. I don't know why they're aiming at us. 
they must be thinking we have no brain. But we have a continent where America, Europe, and India can go in all at once. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is heartbreaking that in spite of this wealth, Africa continues to lose her resources through illicit financial flows. The African Union in 2012 commissioned a, 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 a survey under President Mbeki. It is called the Mbeki Report, where they had to look at how our money is moving from one place to another. It breaks my heart that African leaders are called corrupt. But then when our resources leave at night by planes or through this report, they are not, those, those minnows are not going back to Africa. So this is a situation where we all must take responsibility. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the Mbeki report identified that multinational corporations are the biggest culprit of illicit outflows, followed by organized crime. That's why we have to be vigilant. We have unfortunately weak governance capacity in most of our countries, and this has created a favorable environment for illegal business to thrive, the panel added. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, This raises some questions on my mind. One, why is it that our African leaders, we African leaders, are not raising our domicile in the West and some tax havens? Why isn't the West aggressively pursuing these criminal enterprises and be true partners in Africa's social and economic development by returning that money back to Africa. Countries continue to struggle to get the money back that was illegally externalized into overseas banks. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the foreign countries, I was laughing the other day, they have even got the audacity. When they return the money to the country, they ask the money, the country, how are you going to use it? How did you use it? You must be accountable. Oh, you were not accountable in the first place when you took our money. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all this makes me wonder, what would great Azikiwe have done to correct this injustice? Why is it that our generation isn't moved to stop this illicit flow for the sake of the general good of the Nandi Azikiwe legacy. As a continent, we are not just losing these huge resources. This corruption and illegal externalization of our resources is a direct contribution to the current suffering of our people through economic stagnation, squeeze the fiscal space for infrastructure development and natural disasters. On the point of natural disasters, Malawi this year has had devastated, had been devastated by Cyclone Fred that left over 1,000 people dead and 2 million people displaced. The president of Malawi appointed me goodwill ambassador for the reconstruction, the post Cyclone Fred reconstruction. So we are building houses and we are distributing food. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and as I have discussed, and what I have discussed so far, shows that there's a direct impact on all these challenges on our women and girls. Men as well, but they have told us that the face of poverty are women and girls. As we speak, and I don't know how this is acceptable, as we speak, 50 million girls are out of school in Africa alone. They are abused, 
they are overworked, they get into early marriages, hence highest victims of maternal death. I don't even want to go into harmful traditions that the children face, these poor African girls. If it is in Malawi, they are cleansed by age nine. I don't want to go into what cleansing is because to make us sick. If it is Kenya, they are mutilated. If it is Nigeria, not only are they mutilated by the preference of a boy child is killing us too. When you are married, it is expected that it's better to have a boy than a daughter. And you panic as a woman that it be a boy. <laughs> if it is a girl, it's not my fault. Go and read science books, it's not my fault. But these are the challenges and the traditions that will happen all over Africa. If it is in Ghana, then maybe it is a uh, trocosh. And they banned this practice in 1995, but we still have 1,400 1, women still in the bush under the trocosh tradition. If it is Cameroon, then this child by age 10, breasts are coming out. Then it is breast signing. I was talking to a girl in New York. I said, let's go back to Cameroon and fight breast signing. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, well, when the breasts start coming out, they take a hot rod and they press on your chest. And she said, ah, is that what my mother was doing to me? Up until that time, She's a university graduate, she's working, she didn't know she was breast ironed. We had to phone her mother, there and then, who admitted to say, well, it's tradition. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, equally, women are critical human resource on the continent of Africa. And it is a resource that is in abundance. Women are the majority of the African population and are critical players in both formal and informal business sector. I have always said, and when I said this in, Nam in Namibia, when President Nioma was guest of honor at a business forum, I said, and I quote myself, in our African traditions where men eat first and the best and most, men have become the primary beneficiaries of our economic activities. Therefore, our brothers should help us excel in business because at the end of the day, when we do well in business, our family enjoys better health, better education for our children, and better nutrition. A McKinsey Global Institute report shows that women contribute 37% of global economic growth when they are economically empowered. And I have said that when women are assisted with economic empowerment, it is a key to social and political empowerment. Because in our nations, when we campaign for political office, we have to use a lot of money. And when we don't have money, we don't win. But our communities would benefit from a good leader in us, but we can't win because we have no money. It is worth knowing as well that our African peace security mechanisms have increasingly recognized how critical women are on mediation. So we are demanding that we should sit in those committees and participate in mediation and peace making. It is however disheartening, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, that these women, these girls, are being exploited by peacekeepers. UN keep peacekeepers. The reports are there from DRC. Now we are getting reports from Haiti as well. So we have evidence that our women should be protected. In spite of all these challenges, women continue to excel. I'm proud to be associated with the historical fact that Africa has more women leaders, presidents, than America itself. 
I asked. I was honored at the UN, uh, at the, uh, sorry, at the uh, 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 embassy of the African Union six years ago. Me and Ellen said, and a Nigerian lady living in America stood to ask a question. And he said, she said, Mom, help me. I was born at home in Africa, in Nigeria, and I am resident here for most of my life. I go back and forth, and I ask my fellow women in Africa to say, let's rise, let's fight, let's raise our voices, let's demand that we should have equal presentation. So I asked her, I said, this country where you live, how many women are in parliament? 18%. Have you yet achieved in 200 years equal pay for equal work? Not yet. How many vice presidents have you had? None. How many presidents that are women have been to your state house? Nobody. I said, then what makes this place better than Africa? You should be proud of your Africa because Africa has produced six female presidents. Rwanda holds the highest record of women's representation in parliament on earth, not just in Africa, in the world. 64% and 37% in the Senate. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the continent was of having produced all these women. My friend Ellen Selif of Liberia transitioned from war to peace. We, are, we make better leaders, we take risks, we fight corruption, it fights us back because when you decide I'm going to arrest you thieves, they'll fight you back. They don't just, they're not, they're not playing, they have resources to do it. You have to decide as a female leader, do I want to stand for truth or not? And when somebody asked me, and then somebody was my own husband, Richard Band, he said, be prepared to exit if, when you have started arresting thieves. I said, yes, if that is the price I have to pay, there is life after presidency, but to jail they will go. And as I'm talking to you now, some are still in, in jail. My husband told me he's one of the finest lawyers Malawi has produced. He has been Chief Justice of Malawi and Swaziland. I don't know how many people have done that. He told me that when you're standing for the truth, be resilient and be persistent because nothing will happen to you, especially with a country with an independent judiciary like Malawi. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Gentlemen, as I conclude, I wanted to ask a few questions. Because then, then I have got this speech that will be given out. But I thought in the, in the interest of time, I should just say the following. Meanwhile, the representation of women in Nigerian politics has been going down since 2011. This is a country of great women, eh? great men, great achievers. You are leading in sport, in music, in everything. The African women from Nigeria are leading WTO, United Nations. In fact, I was saying in another speech somewhere, one day we shall have a prime minister in London from Nigeria. It is, can happen. So the question that bothers me is why is the same not happening in Parliament? These last elections I came and I watched my fellow women be cry, trying so hard as it turned out. What they had sent me to come and discuss with President Buhari a year and a half ago was 6%. And President Buhari said, Madam Joyce Banda, we will take the bill to parliament. 
And our distinguished president did just that. And the bill ended up in parliament. And it was thrown out.